Um, hello and welcome to the UK Asian. We are here with the uh, parliamentary candidate for the Conservative Party from Newport East. It is indeed, yes. Out on the Welsh coast, mm -hmm. Natasha Asger. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank a very well-known figure in the British Asian uh, community, a well-known TV star. You're too kind. <laughs> um, why politics? I actually got into politics at a very young age. I was really passionate from the age of 16 and actually did my first bout of work experience in the Welsh Assembly. Okay. And after finishing my GCSEs and deciding what to do, I want, what I wanted to do with my life, I decided to pursue politics and mm. did it for my BA. I did my BA in politics and social policy and then I proceeded to do a master's in contemporary British politics and media. But wow. along the way, I worked in the House of Commons, I worked in the European Parliament, so I can say my political experience is pretty broad. Mm. Do you speak Welsh, by the way? I can say, Borida, which is good morning, Nochda, right. which is good night, Kaznewid, which is Newport, which is what counts the most, mm. and uh, Diokonwa, which is thank you. <laughs> um, but is, is that, um, I mean, how much, how much of a, of a role does language actually play in Welsh politics? Just, just give us an idea about how that works. Well, language, I believe, is very important, particularly as it, it helps a person, an in industry, an area preserve its heritage. Mm. Within my particular constituency of Newport East, there are Welsh-speaking schools, and there is a desire for a lot of people to learn Welsh. How far that will help and go in the big wide world, mm. that's still yet to be seen, because many industries you know, favor foreign languages, but Welsh, it's a very difficult one because it's not recognized in many countries, unfortunately. Mm. So in relation to how, where it's involved in politics, I know for a fact that in the Welsh assembly, there are dual languages. So Welsh and English are spoken, and obviously many people do like to have Welsh in, taught in schools, particularly right. young children like to have the options. But in reality, day to day in Newport... And you were taught that in school? Uh, for a very <laughs> short period of time. But then when I went and did GCSEs and A-levels, it was always French and German. They mm. were the ones that were given more precedence. So that's what I studied for my A-levels. Right. And, and I believe your father was also involved in some way in politics in the area as well. Yeah. Tell me about that. My father is the assembly member, the Conservative Regional Assembly Member for South Wales East. He right. has been elected twice and it's something that we're very proud of. He worked very, very hard for his seat and it's something that he will be fighting again for next year okay. in the Welsh Assembly elections. And um, I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, let's, let's, let's go back okay. beyond um, your schooling and, and your entry into politics. Tell me about how your parents got to here. Uh, where they came from and and uh, and why they came to Newport? Well, my father actually came to the UK many, many years ago. I think when there was a surge of people who wanted to come here to study. Mm. They always are, but in his generation, he wanted to come here to better himself. My father's from an Air Force background. Okay. All my uncles are Air Force. They're very high up in the chain. They're all retired now. Mm. Um, but dad came to this country. He studied to do his MBA here in London. And then when he... He applied for lots of jobs, as young graduates do, and he actually got a job as a, a, a pupilage, I should say, working for an accountancy firm in Wales. Mm. So he then moved, and his desire, he actually studied political science at university, but oh. he never made much use of it. He thought that for a good job, a stable job, it's important to have your own business. He got on and managed to do maths pretty well, so accountancy seemed to be the right mm. option for him. And he was originally from... Yeah, he was originally, well, orig he was born in Amritsar, right. moved to Pakistan. My grandfather was in the Air Force and he was a businessman, so he travelled a lot. Okay. And my uncles then travelled the world with their jobs and dad equally as well. How much of a role did that heritage, the Pakistani heritage, or the South Asian heritage, mm. play when you were growing up? Very much so. My parents have always placed a great emphasis that it's important to have both values. Mm. They're very much westernized, they're very modern people, my parents, but at the same time they like to preserve their heritage and culture. So at home, I tend to speak Urdu or Hindi with them. When I'm getting shouted at, it'll always be in Punjabi, but then I will always respond in either English or Hindi. So it, right. they believe in multiculturalism to a huge extent. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued, intrigued because especially um, uh, given your parents kind of you know that that typical immigrant story mm. and you know uh, people say that people talk about you know politics being right wing and left wing and mm. and all of that but these days everybody's kind of mingling in the center as it were either you're left of center or right of center mm. how did wh how and what actually shaped your political ideologies mm -hmm. and, your, and your politics essentially mm -hmm. and how much did the immigrant background kind of influence mm -hmm. um, that your politics personally? I'm British. I have always considered myself to be British. I was born here, I was raised here, Fiji, I was educated here. I'm 
part, this is my community. As much as I have love for India, Pakistan, it gave me my parents. They've given me everything in the world. But I believe Britain is my home. I believe in the greatness of Great Britain in every sense of the word. Mm. And I feel that my parents had to go through a lot of hardship. They, like many people, they experienced racism. These are some of the things I stand against. I don't feel that in any way I shouldn't be part of society in every way I want to be. And in order to do that, I feel that there are certain places, certain areas, in politics even, where Asian women, such as myself, need to be recognized, need to be a part of, and in order to do that, they always say, there was a famous saying, be the change that you want to see in the world. Mm. Why can't it be me? Mm. I know Justin Greening said over the weekend, uh, when she was interviewed by Sky News um, on International Women's Day, that there has been tremendous progress made in terms of female representation in Parliament, in terms of uh, British Asian representation in Parliament. Oh. Um, where, what, are, what are your thoughts on where we are at the moment as, as a community, as, uh, as a woman? Uh, and um, you know, how much further would you like it to have been? Honestly, with no disrespect against Justine, everyone's entitled to their opinion. And she may feel that there's representation. I don't think it's enough. Hmm. I'm one of those people who I want more. And it was my, my basic belief, my father's belief, the reason why he entered politics was because he wanted to see more ethnic minorities become involved in politics. Mm. He doesn't want to be the first and the last Asian who enters and leaves the Welsh Assembly. I don't want to be, I won't be the first, but I don't certainly want to see myself as the last, you know, pr prospective parliamentary candidate for the Conservative Party in this election or even in any other. There are lots of ethnic minority candidates, I accept that this mm. year. But still, I would like to see a lot more women, particularly from the ethnic minority, get involved in politics because it's important to be part of the community. That's part of my political manifesto, that I feel it's very important to build bridges within the community, and becoming involved in politics is a way to do that, mm. is a way to see that you can provide change, you can make a difference, you can help others in the community in whatever political party you may be from. It doesn't matter if you're conservative, Lib Dem, Labour, but get involved, that's my big message. So what is, what is um, holding women back? What is holding uh, ethnic minorities back? Is there something fundamentally uh, wrong with the system or is there a fundamental barrier in the system? You know, I always have this debate at home. We always talk about it because it's something that we're very passionate about as a family and I am as an individual. And the few things are, it's a very risky job getting into politics mm. because there's no security. If you're an accountant or a doctor or a lawyer, you know that you will you know, as long as you don't do anything wrong, your job is secure. You will be able to get employment somewhere else. If, for example, you are made redundant, you can work as a locum. You can go and work somewhere else. You can, there are options. In politics, you're there for five years. You may not be there for another five. What are you going to do for income? And it's very, very difficult for a lot of people to think, oh, can I really take that risk? Plus, there's a lot of work involved in campaigning and canvassing. Yeah. Your life will be put on hold. Mm. In my case, I'm having to leave my job, my dream job, to go and fight a campaign. Because as a I TV believe, presenter. As yeah. a TV presenter, because I love what I do. And for me, it's taking that risk. But a lot of people will be reluctant to take that risk. If you have a mortgage, if you have children, if you have, you know, dreams and aspirations, you can fulfill them, but there's no guarantee you're going to win at the end of the day. Mm. It's a big risk. And that's something I think it's put up people in a lot of... Well, it makes people reluctant to get involved. So was that was there a single kind of defining moment? Uh, uh, you, you've, you've contested before, um, and yet you've got this, this parallel life where you've got this hugely successful career. Um, you know, you've got a great life in London, um, and I'm sure even whenever you can, you go out to Newport, it's, it's beautiful, it's pleasant, and all of that. Yeah. Um, was there a fundamental moment? Or was there a specific moment where you said, you know what, I need... This is something that I need to fight for. Why? Vidya, I've not stood for Parliament before. I've stood for European elections, European elections. and I've stood for the Welsh Assembly elections yeah. before. So for me, I thought, I live in London. I have my home here. I have a base here. For me, getting around, doing whatever I need to do is not going to be difficult. And I have a base, and my home, my heart is in Wales. I was born there. I was raised there. Hmm. You can represent the place better when you know it through and through. And I know every aspect of my constituency. I know the people. I've grown up with most of them. I know their parents. I know their grandparents. And those I don't know, I'm getting to know because I'm canvassing like crazy when I'm back. Mm. And for that reason, I genuinely feel that Newport East, my constituency, unfortunately has really deteriorated over the years. Newport, mm. from what it was many years ago, has gone downhill. And everyone I speak to who's from Newport either runs away from the place or they're saying we need some change, mm. and I want to be able to do that. How much of that is down to the Labour administration? Sadly, a lot of it. Okay.
and 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 how is that reflective of the kind of wider elements in other parts of the country? Is it does it mirror uh, other similar areas of the country? Sadly, it does. Unfortunately, there is a lack of jobs within the area. There is a huge rate of people who haven't got basic GCSE qualifications, and not specific age groups, but unfortunately there are a lot of people in the area who haven't got basic A to, a to D grades. Mm. And there's a disenchantment, particularly within politics. People feel, what, what good is it going to do? Mm. The, cr the crime rate was very, very high. Newport was regarded one of the most violent towns in the UK at one point. That has improved a lot. Mm. It has improved a lot, and I think the Police and Crime Commission is doing a wonderful job in the area. I really do, and I think the police force is one to be reckoned with, particularly in Gwent. There are unfortunately a lot of drugs going around, and I don't mean just in schools, I mean outside as well. And there's a huge issue which needs to be addressed, which I'm hoping that I can do. So does this kind of validate the argument uh, that under the, the, the economic growth that's, that the country is enjoying under the Conservative government, mm -hmm. uh, and it has, let's, yeah. let's admit that, mm -hmm. um, that, it's, that prosperity is centred in London and big cities and it's not kind of... Uh, um, spreading out into into the smaller towns. Well, I would say that Labour would jump up and down and say, "Yes, Vijay, we totally agree with you." Because in Wales, it's a d many of these issues are devolved mm. because you have the Welsh Assembly yeah. in place there. So they will say, "Yes, totally, we don't feel we're getting enough money and nothing's happening, and this is why I woe to me. This is why the situation is the way it is." Mm. But realistically, I think that. In regards to Wales, with certain areas, devolved matters, I think that the Labour government there, unfortunately, haven't made full use of the funds that they have. Mm. In the past, funds have actually been administered from Europe and from the government in London, and it's not been administered properly. Things have been bought, things, money has been spent on certain things, enterprise zones, various you know, buildings, etc., business ventures, which haven't materialised to anything. So it's not benefited the community in any way. Mm. So unfortunately, that's the benefit of having a Conservative government. You have a business savvy brain, you know people who have business acumen, know the way to go forward, and the proof is in the pudding. The statistics show themselves. Yeah. And, but, but I mean, you're, 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 you're fighting against a fundamentally kind of Labour-leaning uh, electorate, isn't it, mm. out there? Um, that, must be, that must be a tremendously difficult thing to contend with. It is, I won't lie to you, but I've fought many elections before and I know that there's always an angst because it, and Wales is a very much labour dominated area. It always has been because of the steelworks, because of the coal mining industry that's been there, very well known across the world. It, will, it is always a tough, it's a tough battle, but the proof is in the pudding. We still do have Conservative representatives from Wales. Mm. So it does show that people do want change. People do believe in moving forward with business. And they believe in the values of the Conservative Party mm. at large. And that's always a good thing. And I'm getting a great response from the street, from going leafleting, from meeting people, from going to different events. People really are keen to know what the Conservatives are doing. And they are genuinely quite happy with what David Cameron is doing. Some are disgruntled. You're not going to find everyone happy. But the majority of people are very open-minded towards the change that David Cameron's bringing, which is great to hear and see. Mm. Uh, let's talk national politics. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're in a coalition at the moment, and according to many, mm -hmm. um, another coalition is inevitable. Um, do, you, do you believe that? Um, and if so, uh, who, who would you, as a Conservative, like to go into power with? Honestly, no one. Okay. I think because yeah, well, that, that's, the, that's the party line. <laughs> that, that's the party line. But I mean, realistically, practically speaking, honestly, let's wait till the election's over. And I promise you, once we realise where we are, we'll be in a stronger position to comment. At the moment, I know everyone's talking about Labour getting involved with, you know, the SNP, and then someone saying that UKIP are going to get involved with Labour. And it's all sorts. Of, there's so many different rumours doing the rounds. Mm. Let's wait and see. Let's get David Cameron back as Prime Minister and go from there. What What if What if it came to uh, a Conservative UKIP coalition? If the, if the I, I know, you know, David Cameron said that no way, they, they, this would never happen. Mm. Uh, but um, would that is is that something that is possible? Do you think? I believe, obviously, look, there have to be tough decisions in any political movement. There has to be room for change. There has to be room for manoeuvre. I believe David Cameron, if he's what he sta says, he norm he pretty much stands by. He said he would improve the economy, he's done it. He said that he would increase the rate of people who were getting an education, he's done it. Everything he said so far, he has pretty much done it. Mm. Some people will argue he's not done enough. How much can you do in five years? He's had a lot, well, I'm not just defending the Prime Minister, but they've had a lot mm. to deal with. The yeah. financial mess that this country was in, 
was diabolical and I understand because even in Wales they were going absolutely crazy because I used to work for the Welsh Assembly as well mm. they were going crazy because no one was quite aware of the how bad the books actually were and when I mean books the accounting books as to what we had and what we didn't have in this country because financially this country was genuinely in tatters we lost our status in the EU we lost our A grade it, there was a lot going on at that time and he's turned it around so I genuinely feel whatever decision he makes will be for the benefit of everybody mm. and if he's saying he's not going to you know, take part in certain coalitions. Well, that's a decision he'll have to make with the elected members at the time. Um, I, and, and another thing that a lot of people are saying about uh, this general election is it's going to be the most fractious in a, in a generation, mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, quite a lot mm -hmm. due to the rise of of, of UKIP and, and what they're the, how they are dividing the electorate. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make of UKIP? What do you make of Nigel Farage? As an individual or as a politician? As, as a, both as an individual and as a politician. Individually, I don't know him. <clears throat> Politically, I can understand why he's saying what he's saying. He's saying it to get a reaction. He's saying it to find out from other people what they think. And to be honest, I think there are a lot of people who perhaps some people consider right-wing conservatives who are following his line. I don't think that's the case. I think what he's jumping on are all those issues which people aren't very happy about. Immigration, for example, it's one of those issues that's causing a lot of people, you know, concern, sleepless nights. It's causing a lot of tension, particularly within communities across the UK. And he's playing on a lot of people's emotions with that. Mm. That I don't appreciate and respect, because I genuinely feel that David Cameron is doing a lot in relation to immigration. He stood up to Angela Merkel. He's trying to put as many boundaries and barriers and toughen the law in relation to illegal immigrants, in relation to benefits. So much he's trying to do in order to try and control the immigration issue. It's not something that's going to be fixed overnight, let's be honest. I personally, in my ward, am having issues with UKIP. Mm -hmm. I've had many accounts whereby they've not only been very, very, very um, discriminatory to people who are homosexual, they've then also gone ahead and been very insensitive to p victims of the Holocaust. And on, based on that, it's been these stories have been picked up, unfortunately, by the national press because it reflects the true colours of UKIP. Mm. Unfortunately, and I can, the proof is in all the papers, it's in the statements that have been made, they are incredibly racist. And that's something that I am totally against in every sense of the word. I am against anything that is discriminatory towards another human being. I don't feel that it's right. Like I said, I was born in this country, I'm part of society here. I don't feel that I should be discriminated against because where my parents are from or what they do or their background, so therefore I feel the same about others. Hmm. Why should they be discriminated against? But but then uh, you, you know on, on the on the issue of of immigration, a lot of people feel, particularly from our community, from the mm -hmm. South Asian community, that whilst the the Cameron government has made these all of these overtures to, for instance, the government of Narendra Modi, mm -hmm. uh, it is you know Theresa May and, and and David Cameron are also trying to compensate for the inability to stop European immigration mm. by imposing sanctions on immigrants from our part of the world, the South Asian subcontinent. Mm. Um, and that hasn't really gone down well with ethnic minority communities. No, it hasn't. And I'll be honest with you, I've met so many constituents in my area. I'm speaking from my constituency because they're the ones who I'm meeting yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. The um, fact that the level has been set, particularly in relation to income, for example, there needs to be a basic rate of income which you need to earn in order to bring your spouse from abroad. Mm. That's proving to be very, very difficult. It was a decision that went to the courts. The courts have said we're not changing it. So it's something that we have to deal with. In relation to immigration, checks and balances have to be put somewhere. Unfortunately, it breaks my heart for many people whose spouses are abroad and they're struggling to bring them over. It's something that they ha are having to tighten because of this that many years ago, the agreements that were made with the EU, which allowed the free movement of goods, trades, people and services, which was done under Labour, not the Conservatives, it's now coming to unfortunately bite the Conservatives hard. And it's something that they're having to make really tough decisions about. It's something, like I said to you earlier, people aren't happy about, they're not thrilled about, but it's something that has to be controlled because we don't have the jobs available. We don't have the opportunities available for everybody here. Britain is a great country, but you need to work on these things first. Mm. For everybody here, people there are many people who are unemployed, there are many people who are struggling, students who want to go to university. There are a lot of deep issues that we need to deal with on the home front mm. first. So multiculturalism, um, has that been a success or not? For me or for general, or you mean generally? Generally for Britain. I think it's brilliant. I think multiculturalism has boosted, the, boosted tourism, trade, business. There has been a lot of it. 
as you can see in Wales particularly you have Dardar Steel you have so many different industrialists and businesses coming into the UK investing here want to invest here as I was reading an article a few weeks ago that the majority of mo the most expensive properties in London are owned by some of the wealthiest Russians in the world mm. so it shows that and Britain, Indians and Indians, <clears throat> Britain is a diverse place it's a diverse country it will always welcome people from abroad who are willing to give to society not just those who are here to take so you know um, with regards to uh, the Home Secretary, some of the some of the proposals that she's put forward, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, introducing this three thousand pound uh, sorry bond uh, on uh, quote unquote high risk visitors from the Asian subcontinent mm -hmm. and and parts of Africa, mm -hmm. uh, would that be something that you would vote for, or um, is that something that this country requires, the system requires? I think there's, unfortunately, we always hear about so many, and we see on TV, you, we, you watch the shows, I watch the shows, where immigrants come to this country, they come for holidays, they come for visits, and then they go missing. Mm. They go AWOL. And unfortunately, them living on the streets, or whether they're claiming benefits illegally, or doing whatever, it's costing the taxpayer. It's costing the taxpayer to upkeep them whilst they're here in the UK. But that's a very small percentage, though, isn't it? But it's the one that's causing the concern for people. It's the one that's worrying everybody. And that's the one you're hearing about in the news all the time. Then as, as a politician or as a political party, is it not then your job to actually tell people, no, this is, uh, perhaps this has been overblown? Mm, but it's, it's one aspect. It's one small part of a big issue. Mm. So all, every aspect of that issue needs to be dealt with. If this is what Theresa May has suggested and said in that one, in that one particular strand, then that's, she's had good reason and good justification to do so. But in relation to other aspects of this issue which we're discussing, it's going to be a problem and it needs to be curbed. And people need to know that by doing this and coming to the UK, you can't just settle here and run away. There have to be consequences. Unfortunately, thousands of people have gone missing when having come to this country upon their visa expiring or their stay expiring. And that's led to a lot of problems. And unfortunately, it's having a backlash, particularly within communities. Mm. That's something that worries me. And that's not something that's going to end, particularly with what's happening in North Africa and Syria and um, uh, you know, Egypt and but so But the on. hope is, by having things such as this bond, it will do that. It will little limit it to an extent. It, well, okay, it'll, it'll limit it. What about Europe um, uh, and, and, and Britain's relationship with Europe? Um, where do you, and especially from the point of view as a former uh, someone who was contested for the European Parliament, mm. where do you stand on that? And, and you know, um, how much or how much more, how much less should we be uh, connected to Europe? And how important is being connected to Europe? Okay, I'm not going to turn around and say to you, I think the European Parliament should just be abolished. No, let's be realistic. It's not going anywhere. Like the Welsh Assembly, like the Scottish Parliament, it's not going. It's there. It's there to stay. But at the same time, I do feel that the European Parliament, in certain relations to the laws, and I should say particularly within the movement of people, goods and services in and out of the UK, I think that in many ways Britain has had a tough deal. Unfortunately, agreements that were signed many years ago are now coming back, particularly when Britain slowly, the economy is slowly improving, bit by bit, day by day, mm. being hit with you know, debts that we have to pay in or because we've, our economy has improved compared to other European countries. That was a big blow for the Conservative government, for everybody who lives in the UK, because it's like you're paying a price because you've achieved something. Mm. And for I, Greece and Italy. Exactly. And mm. we were, and I know that Britain, you know, has, and David Cameron's done a lot in order to stand up for various things that he doesn't believe in, which previous leaders haven't done that much of. They pretty much bowed their heads and were like, yes, uh, no, sir, yes, fine, that's okay with us, we'll carry on doing it. So I have to give him 10 out of 10 for the fact that he stood up for something he believed in. He stood up for something that people in the UK believed in. Mm. Why should we have to do so much? It's fine. We 100%. It's great to be part of the EU. It's great to have that connectivity amongst EU states. It's great for business. It's good for trade. It's good for moving around and understanding others' cultures, for tourism. It's great in that respect. But when it comes to people moving here, settling down because they want to you know, benefit from the benefit system, without having worked here, without having contributed to society, that's a cause of concern, not just to him, to me, but to everybody. Mm. So by all means, come to the UK if you're from the UK, if from in the EU country, but please contribute to the UK as well, and then be part of it. No one's got a problem against that. Yeah, I mean, you know, welf welfare tourism, for instance, as as, as they talk about, uh, is something that a lot of a uh, lot of even ethnic minority voters are concerned about. Uh, but then uh, many say that the actual system itself mm. is flawed. This is a system that 
was created in the aftermath of the first, Second World War mm -hmm. for, for a devastated country. It doesn't really, some of the rules really shouldn't be uh, applicable today. Mm -hmm. So that change the system as opposed to, for instance, going and changing your uh, international agreements, wouldn't that be a better way of uh, resolving an issue like welfare tourism? It is, but aside from that, that's why the Conservative government have put on benefit caps. They're making it more... Uh, I should say, lucrative for people to go out and work than it is to stay home and reap benefits. Mm. It's something that they feel very strongly about. It's something that I feel very strongly about. Why should someone who's working earn less than someone who's home on benefits? I have, I'm, I'm, I'm plumbing record, I have no qualm, no quibble with people taking benefits. Mm. If it's justified, if it's for people who have disabilities or for any reason are unable and unfit to work, Please, that's what the benefit system is there for. I have, let me go on the record and say, as a conservative, I have no problem stating that. But for those people who use, abuse, and milk the benefit system, and who come here, as you say, for, you know, for uh, benefit handouts, that I feel is unjust. And for that reason, it's important, like I said earlier, to contribute to society, be part of the UK, and then if in future, if at any point you need those benefits, and you need it for a legitimate reason, have them, they're there. Hmm. Right, so let's let's um, let's not talk about politics. Okay. Now. Let's let's talk about uh, on uh, on, a, on a parting note, just a, um, on a, on a personal level. Um, where do you see yourself going? I mean, you know, you've taken a sabbatical from uh, from your TV work. Okay. Um, you get elected. What's uh, you know ultimately? What's your um, what's your ultimate goal in term, with regards to politics? Honestly, really, my ultimate goal in regards to anything I do in life, there are two words. World domination. That's World it. domination. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so US president then. You never know. You never know. Never say never, as they say. Never say never. Who are your personal heroes? Like, women, particularly. Do you know what? There are, I, I was asked this question not so long ago, and I have to say there are a lot of inspirational women. On a personal level, I would have to say... And I'm going to sound very cheesy, very corny when I say this. On a personal level, I'd have to say someone like my mother. Because she's been through a lot in her life. And she's come out shining the other side. She was a... She's been a patient of cancer. She came to the UK. She's a qualified doctor. She married slightly later than perhaps most Asian women would. Because she wanted to make something of herself. She wanted to achieve something in life. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to settle down and have a family. And she was also, by coincidence, the mayoress of Brent. Because my grandfather, my nana, was the mayor of Brent. Oh, right. So she was his lady mayoress when he was mayor of the Bre mayor of Brent in the 80s. Hmm. So I have a lot of time and respect for her because she survived her illness. She pursued her career. She lived her life. She is the role, perfect role model in many ways. But politically, if you want to ask me, I would say someone like Queen Rainey of Jordan. I have a lot of respect for her in the sense that she's a humanitarian. She's a mother. She's a family person. And she juggles her responsibilities beautifully with dignity, with grace and great decorum. Hmm. And that's someone who I admire. Um, as, a, as, a, as a very, very final, final thought, then uh, is, that, is politics the reason that you've put off marriage as well? Or? It has been one of the reasons, yes. Okay. Natasha, thank you very much. Thank for you very us. much. It's thank a pleasure. You. Thank you very much.